Shalom, everyone, from Interfaithfulness, where we're building bridges, where history builds walls. I promised you that I was going to uh, start doing a uh, missiological presentation for you, six sessions. And I'm starting today. But some people ask, what's a missiologist? A missiologist is somebody who uh, is an expert in the various disciplines that contribute to understanding how to communicate religious truth and sustain it across cultures. So I have a PhD in missiology, also known as a PhD in intercultural studies, because it involves uh, bridging various cultures with transcendent truth. Um, and for the last 50 years, what really has rung my charms is uh, learning how to better explain Yeshua faith to people who might not want to hear about it or may never have heard about it, and especially to my people, the Jewish people. It's just something that began to really uh, interest me and give me a holy haunting when I was in my early 20s. I'm not in my early 20s anymore. But today we'll be doing the first session in this six C's of faith sharing. And today we want to talk about the fact that when you share your faith, in the background of this is a context and the context is Israel's God story. You're not just giving people a technique about how to be saved, so-called. Uh, you are, are, are helping them to find their place in God's world and find God's will for their life. And to do that, you need some background. You need Israel's God story. So I'm going to give you um, a... Uh, uh, the first of five aspects of Israel's God story. And here it is in fancy Latin, creatio et ex nihilo. In the beginning, God created all that is, which in the Hebrew idiom is the heavens and the earth. The kind of message we're talking about is a message that is rooted in a God who is not the force. He's not a feeling. He's not something inside of me, inside of you, inside of everybody. He is the one, the being, who created all that is. The whole space-time continuum was created by this being, this God, who, as we follow Israel's God story, will discover is a personal God. So the first thing you need to recognize is that this whole story is grounded in the fact that there is a God who willed that everything else would exist, and without that will, there would be nothing. The second aspect of Israel's God story is, is election. This God is a, uh, this God who created the heavens and the earth, excuse me, I'm hiding behind this now, for reasons of his own, from time to time, chooses those whom he especially designates as his servants and the receptors of his bounty and truth, but who also face consequences for violating the will of their creator. So this is a God who makes choices. He's not just a God who's distant from us, out there in the ozone, out there in space. He's not the great watchmaker who made the universe and then left it alone, as the deists say. He's a God who makes choices. And sometimes we don't like his choices, but that's too bad. You know, uh, we're not God. We don't run this. We don't run this show. He does, and he's the God who created the heavens and the earth and for reasons of his own, from time to time. He chooses the people he designates as his servants, the receptors of his bounty, his truth, but who also face consequences for violating the will of the Creator. God told the prophet Amos. Uh, to say to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will judge you for your sins. Knowing God is a big responsibility. When he chooses you, uh, it's good news, bad news. As uh, Tevye says in Feather on the Roof, do me a favor, could you choose somebody else once in a while? Because uh, those choices have implications. So first God creates, secondly he elects or he chooses. The third aspect of God's work among us is he redeems. He's the God of redemption. The God of all 
who is neither silent nor uninvolved in the affairs of humankind, rescues people again and again according to his gracious choice. This is a redeeming God. That's what Passover is all about. He's a God who uh, pulls our cookies out of the fire. He's a God who, uh, the fancy word often used is he saves, he redeems, he rescues. Uh, you can't read the Bible without discovering that, and it's a great discovery. So this is the worldview in which the story of Yeshua begins to operate and make sense. That there's a God who created all that is, who chooses whom he chooses, uh, to, to, to bless and to bring blessing to the world. And he's a God who also redeems. And as part of that redemption aspect, he gave the Jewish people, this people whom he chose, he gave this people a, uh, a ritual life, a ritual uh, format, uh, the sacrificial system, which was a means of their appropriating his forgiveness. He did this because he's a God whose property is always to redeem. He wants to rescue us if we are willing to be rescued and if we are willing to live with him in peace and obedience. Some people are not. They'd rather do their own thing. And the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends are of the, are the ways of death. In other words, you might think, it's great for me to zoom down the street at 85 miles an hour, but at the end of the street is a dead end, and that's not good news for you. So it's better to obey the signs than uh, to do your own thing. At least that's my opinion, and that's what you learn from the scriptures. Now, not only is a God who is our God who creates out of nothing, who chooses, who redeems, he's also a God who reveals. This God who chose the descendants of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also chose to deeply reveal himself in his ways through the giving of his law on Mount Sinai and through his dealings with his people and their leaders subsequently. He, he chose to give his law to this people. Uh, and not because we were the best. Uh, he says, you were the fewest of the peoples, but because he wanted to keep his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he wanted to be a blessing to the world. So he made a choice to reveal himself by giving of his law and uh, by his subsequent dealings with his people through their leaders, their kings, their priests, their prophets, of whom we have many of their writings in our Bible that also reveal to us the ways of God. This is the universe of meaning in which we find ourselves and in which Yeshua makes sense. Okay? So... We've got creation, we've got election or choosing, we've got redemption, we've got revelation, and we've got one more, consummation. It is the will of the creator and redeemer that in the end, all that is broken in the world he has created will be made whole and will experience transcendent fullness of blessing. God wants our story to have a happy ending. Uh, not everybody is going to be part of that happy ending because uh, it's not the ending that they would choose. There's a great book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. It's, a, it's, it's short. It's, uh, and it's about a group of people on, a, on an excursion bus who take a trip from hell to heaven. And they get to heaven and, not, and none of them like it. Because all their lives they had made choices and had preferences that made living with God forever and ever uh, an annoyance. And so when they spend their eternity excluded from God's presence, they're only getting what they were heading for all along. Now you may not agree with that, but there's a lot of truth in it. And I suggest you read The Great Divorce. It's a book that is not to be missed. So I want to read you a few passages about this great consummation that God has in mind. First, from Isaiah 25. On this mountain in Jerusalem, Adonai Tzavot, the Lord of hosts, will make for all peoples a feast of rich food and superb wines, delicious rich food and superb elegant wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil which covers the face of all peoples, 
the veil enshrouding all the nations, and he will swallow up death forever. Adonai Elohim will wipe out the tears, will wipe the tears from every face, and he will remove from all the earth the disgrace of his people. For Adonai has spoken. On that day they will say, See, this is our God. We waited for him to save us. This is Adonai. We put our hope in him. We are full of joy, so glad he saved us. For on this mountain the hand of Adonai will rest. Doesn't get any better than this. Zechariah says this, On that day there will be neither bright light nor thick darkness, and one day known to Adonai will be neither day nor night, although by evening there will be light. On that day fresh water will flow out from Jerusalem, half toward the eastern sea and half toward the western sea, both summer and winter. Then Adonai will be king over the whole world. On that day Adonai will be the only one, and his name will be the only name. At the end of the Alenu, a Jewish prayer at the end of every one of our services. In that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Finally, Isaiah, a very familiar passage. In the last days, the mountain of Adonai's house will be established as the most important mountain. It will be regarded more highly than the other hills, and all the Gentiles, all the nations, will stream there. Many peoples will go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Yaakov. He will teach us his ways, we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth Torah and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and arbitrate for many peoples. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and neither will they learn war anymore. This is the context, this whole mixture of realities is the context in which the message of Yeshua finds a home and makes sense. Why don't you look at this video again and then, if you like, next time, uh, in a day or so, I will do the second of the six C's of faith sharing. And that is communication. Uh, no, content. What is the content of our faith sharing? Next time, if you will it, it will come, and uh, I will be delighted to bring it to you. Shalom for now.